My name is Irfan Issa. Do remember the name because we're going to come back to that in a bit. And today I'm going to talk to you about artificial intelligence and a little bit of an understanding of the past, the present, and perhaps the future of artificial intelligence. I'm interested in building technologies that are actually building intelligent machines. So you ask, you know, of course, what is an intelligent machine? Well, an intelligent machine is a machine or a system that is capable of extracting information from the environment, sensing something, understanding it, and then doing something in relation to it, reacting to it. So for example, your computer system recognizes who you are and allows you access. Uh, it could be, for example, a system on your bank that detects fraud and prevents access to somebody else who prevents you from getting to that kind of stuff. It could even be things like your Fitbit that recognizes if you're falling asleep or not. You know, those types of different types of things we're sensing, leading to an action with an understanding in between. That's what AI does. And of course, many people like me have been building systems like this for about 30 years. So what I'd like to do today is take you through a journey that I started as a student to the present day about how we've been building these systems. This is less about me, but more about actually telling you how things have evolved over time. Okay? So one of the things we are interested in is, of course, building these systems that would actually be aware of what we're doing and respond to us. So 30 years or so back, uh, I found computers very exciting, okay? Because they could do a lot in terms of computation. I could actually get a computer to simulate physical phenomena, things like breaking, putting something like, if I was to put something like this on my hands, you all know from physics that if I put it on some other type of thing, it's gonna fall, right? Simulation, basic lever and stuff that you learn in physics. Now, how do you build that kind of stuff into a computer? That's what I was doing as an engineering student. Of course, it started figuring out very quickly that, you know, you are very good. I just showed you this, and almost all of you are going to be aware that it's going to fall. Many things, if I was to throw it, you pretty much know that I'll catch it because it came down certain, you know, physics took over. So, of course, the first thing we thought about was, how do we build these kinds of physics in? So many early systems, and even in actually something like 1980s, there were pictorial representations, just taking a picture of something and asking, oh, well, is this going to fall through or is it going to stay, remain stable? Just understanding the physics of these types of things. If you showed it something like it's about to fall, it would predict when it's going to fall. So simulation was an important part of these kinds of things. So as an engineering person, I knew how to do this, but all of a sudden I ran into these people who were doing artificial intelligence and computer vision. Computer vision was an ability to create a system that can see, you know, pretty much like what we do with our eyes. Now, I showed this kind of stuff, and we did, of course, uh, show these systems and pictures to computers, and we wanted the computers to kind of predict what's going to happen. Is it going to fall or not? And that kind of stuff was very interesting, and of course, that got me more interested. We could also do things like take pictures on a conveyor belt at uh, you know, a delivery facility and figure out, oh, this is a big box, or this is a small one, and what are the sizes of these things, how to distribute them. Kinds of stuff we take for granted these days. Another thing that actually I witnessed a video of in about late 1980s was a system, a car, with a camera in front that could detect other cars, lanes, and drive itself and avoid collisions. The kind of stuff, again, we see a lot of. This was something I saw as a student in the 1980s time frame, late. This got me interested in a whole lot of this stuff. Of course, I was a naive young kid, not knowing anything about any of this kind of stuff, just wanting to do things, but this was the era where AI was actually coming big. Artificial intelligence and technologies like that were getting really popular. Of course, I was lucky enough to work with some of the best people in there, and the first thing I did for my PhD thesis was develop a system that would recognize human expressions. So now imagine a camera looking at you, you make an expression, and it says, hey, you're happy, you're sad, you know, things like that. Of course, now to do this, I have to go beyond building a physical simulation system. I have to understand human communication, especially things like uh, visible aspects of how I gesture, how I make expressions and stuff. A complete different ballgame, and we had to build that in, to build a system like this. You know, how people make expressions. So, of course, a system that when I make an expression, it mimics me. Like a, you know, a toy problem of some sort. That's what we did. Again, you know, it was very exciting. I learned a lot about human communication. And in fact, the joke I, I have is many a time I would sit there, start looking at people, forget what they're saying, just look at their nonverbal cues of how they make gestures and expressions. My wife would smack me, reboot me, and I would get back to normal. Uh, you know, that's what helped. So, you know, that was something which we did. 
So that's where going from physical simulation, we build things like you know, understanding how humans communicate. Build a system on that kind of stuff. Graduated, came to Georgia Tech, and one of the bigger questions said, okay, now let's scale this up. Let's do something bigger. Trying to track whole bodies in a home situation. So one of the things I started talking about was this whole concept of computers seeing people. Intelligent and aware environments. So what we did uh, was we built actually a full home on the Georgia Tech campus. The name of this home was the Aware Home. Uh, and in this one, we basically instrumented with a whole lot of sensors that would actually understand what's going on and react to different types of things happening in the space. Again, an exciting project. We worked on it. We did. And again, it wasn't just me. It was a huge number of uh, faculty at Georgia Tech and students who worked on this kind of stuff. The other thing is we also now wanted to not just do research, but train the next generation of researchers to do this. It's a great place, Georgia Tech, to do that kind of stuff. A couple of interesting things. I mean, we developed a lot of things. We had a robot moving around in there. Uh, trying to you know, find interesting objects. To cheat it, all of the objects were very nice colored and stuff like that because it was hard to find all of them at that time. I demoed this to many people. I had a very well-known politician from Georgia come visit the lab. I showed him this kind of stuff and he looks at me and he says, oh, finally you have technology that can bring me beer. <laughs> hmm, okay. We are in a beverage company today anyway, so, but a different kind of beverage. Uh, Another person I was talking to, a banker, insurance person, said, oh, you're talking about long-term research, because we're talking about this home that would watch over our kids and adults and everything in healthcare situations. This person looked at me and says, you're talking about long-term research, 50, 30, 15 years, 30 years. You know, there's only one instrument in this country where we think about that kind of a long-term thinking. It's called a home mortgage. That was eye-opening again. Uh, this was, of course, before the subprime collapse, so maybe even now we know more. Uh, so, you know, those kinds of things have kind of been happening, and we've been building these types of technologies since, and this taught me a little bit about, it's not just about the technology, it's what people perceive from this technology and how that becomes a normal part of our lives. I mean, the face example I told you, right now, you can take out your phone, after you take your selfie, you can turn on a variety of Facebook and, uh, you know, Snapchat, it tracks your face. Remember all of the kids that you've seen doing the barf games and stuff like that? It's actually doing the kind of stuff I did for my PhD thesis, now on this device, right? So similarly, this recognizes my face and everything else like that. So computing technology has changed a lot, right? I can walk around and take a picture of this and it would recognize where I am. It would actually take the name Centennial TEDx, transcribe it, right? You can actually be walking in China, pointed to a sign, it will translate it for you. These are the kinds of things that are now available. The other thing which has happened is this thing has gotten smaller, right? The technology, the compute power of this thing is actually more than what actually took us to the moon. Right? So these are the kinds of stuff that we have. There's something called the Moore's Law which has been predicting that every two years the compute power will double. We're about at the plateau of it. Nowadays, faculty like me are sitting, thinking about what next, thinking about these kinds of things are coming in. But, you know, these technologies are interesting. Uh, face recognition works, but also they make mistakes. So, of course, remember, we can predict things like physics. We can also predict things like words. Every time you're typing things on your phone, it's predicting the next word. It's typing it in. Of course, it does interesting things. Remember my name, Irfan? I usually get messages calling organ, <laughs> urban. But my friends who actually met me the first time, and after today, most probably you will vote, they spell my name Ifran, I-F-R-A-N, because it's easier to type I-F than I-R. So computers make mistakes, people make mistakes. They can be both trained to do these types of things and improve upon that kind of stuff. That's the kind of stuff we're thinking about. So now, fast forward to the kinds of things we want to move there. So in my lab, we do a lot of different types of things. We build technologies that observe surgeons and trains them as they do different complicated procedures. We can watch athletes perform different types of physical activities, learn from their behaviors, and tell them more about how to improve their things, but also help do things like gait recognition for people with walking disabilities. We can actually recognize what people are eating, behaviors and stuff like that, guide them in different types of things, improving their health systems. We can actually analyze dynamic scenes, like the ones that cars have, to figure out where the obstacles are. So 
so we can avoid them. We can do a lot of these types of dynamic scenarios. We can analyze them because one thing we do now is give the computers, robots, systems, eyes. One of the things that was different was computers are deaf, dumb, and blind sitting in the corner of the room. That has changed now because the research community I belong to has been spending a lot of time convincing and creating technologies to do this. Nowadays, you all speak to your phones. In the home, there's a small device that also listens to you. If you want to talk to it, and you can actually order things fast, right? You can also do things like have a security system that's aware of a whole lot of things. Kinds of things that are now available, and actually what makes it interesting is some of them are actually 199. The phone is still about 1,000 bucks, but the other technologies are 199. So these types of things are actually becoming prevalent in our society. So at Georgia Tech, one of the things in the growth of this type of taking the engineering perspective is now we have created a huge center uh, for machine learning at Georgia Tech. And the intention of these types of things is to now bring together, uh, create a home for preeminent scholars in the area of machine learning and AI, and also train the next generation. I've been, because I was not fast to move back, volunteered to lead the center right now. Uh, it's an exciting time because we're making some amazing things happen. The thing that's unique about this new level of machine learning and AI from the 1980s when we started this is it's a much cross-disciplinary area. At Georgia Tech, we actually have faculty and students from computing, engineering, and sciences. Well, that's no surprise. But we also have them from humanities, social sciences. We also have them from biomedical engineering types of things. And we also have them from public policy, business, and design. Because the city is going to look different with this kind of technology, right? The home is going to look different. More importantly, public policy has to adapt to what's going to happen with technology, the kinds we're talking about. So working with public policy is important. So our goal really is to start kind of building this new ecosystem that can get ready for thinking about these types of things and build new technologies. Now, a couple of other things to think about. Am I going to predict the future today and tell you when you can actually have an autonomous driving car in your neighborhood? Well, not today, sorry. Uh, it's going to happen in some time or the other, and it's going to be actually something, it's not going to be instantaneous. You know, you're not going to wake up one day and technology is going to be there. It's going to slowly develop. And that's the kind of stuff that is important to think about in technology, is that it's already around us. We're using it. If I was to take your cell phones away today, find you while miss a couple of selfies, you will actually get upset at me. Right? If I take away, for those of you who are nuts about exercising, you will get upset at me if I take over your health dis uh, measuring devices. And you, know, you heard from Medtronic. There is a device that actually monitors your heart that's inside you. That's an advanced computer. Similarly, you know, homes, health, you know, home temperature monitoring is all being done with computers. And as much as you'd like to believe it or not, even those cars that are not driving themselves have a lot of computers inside them yet. There's a lot of technology around you. And in 1980s, when you started to hate calling a phone and leaving a message on an answering machine because you did not want to talk to a computer or a machine, now you prefer to leave messages. <laughs> right? So things have changed. So one of the things we always talk about is you know, how we can understand what's going on with these types of things. And I will just end with one quote that I actually believe in. And this is called Amara's Law, which basically says that we tend to overestimate the effect of technology in the short run and underestimate the effect of technology on the long run. So we've forgotten OCR, the ability to recognize text, speech recognition, that have been developed for the last 30 years are part of our lives. Right now, we are stressed about the fact that somebody is going to build Terminator. Right? Well, I want to build Commander Data. I mean, a friendly person that will help us with our lives. So that's the kind of stuff. Now, yes, to some extent, I will admit, people like me are kids in a candy store. Uh, it's a much better metaphor than a bull in a china shop. Uh, but we're building this technology. We love to engage with people who actually use this technology, join us, help us evaluate these types of technologies, and let's get them out there so you can actually benefit from them. Thank you. Thank you.